There are six types of diarthroidal joints. Each has a different type of bony arrangement or configuration. These are arthroidal, ganglimus, trochoid, condyloid, and arthroidal, and cellar joints. Arthroidal or gliding joints, they have two plane or two flat bony surfaces which butt together against each other. There's little most impossible in any one joint articulation. So in other words, if these two flat surfaces are against each other, they don't move very much. They usually work together in a series of, our, of our different articulations. So let's look at some examples. If we look at the ver intervertebral facets in the spinal column. So if we look at this, we've talked about this numerous times today. If we look at the facets, we have superior and inferior facets, but there's a one above and one below, and they, um, they combine together with the bone, one above or below. So they're told, like we said before, there's not very much motion in there, but when they move, there is a little bit of movement. Every time we move, you know, one, one vertebra will move, but the other one will move as well, too. So if you look at it, it adds up throughout the whole spinal column. We also have movements in the intercarpal and intertarsal uh, bones in there as well, too. So there's very little movement because these surfaces are flat, but they do have some slight movement. Now, if we look at this, especially for the vertebral column. If we look at that, we have motions that are flexion, we extend, we have abduction, adduction, diagonal abduction and adduction. We also have rotation, which is basically circumduction. So we have those, those movements within the vertebral column and in the carpal bones as well, believe it or not, you know, we have flexion, extension, abduction, away, adduction. We have diagonal abduction, adduction. We also have circumduction. So if we look at that, those bones can, if they're all, in, all together, they all work together. So a little bit of movement in each one of those flat surfaces or each one of those little joints. The next joint is a, a hinge joint or ginglimus joint. It's a uniaxial articulation. In other words, it only moves one plane of motion. One axis of rotation, one plane of motion. Its articulating surfaces allow motion only in one plane. The classic example of that is the elbow joint. It will only flex, uh, flex and extend. There's, not any, there's, there's no movement, rotation movement. There's no movement side to side. There's no movement rotationally, but only flexion and extension. However, they say the knee is, is another classic hinge joint, but it's really not. It will, it will extend and flex, but if you look at the knee, there's some slight movement, you know, laterally and medially, and it does do some slight rotation. But for the most part, its primary movement is flexion and extension. The same with the ankle joint too. It does do flexion and extension, but it will move slightly laterally and medially, and there's a little bit of rotation in there, but not much. Next one is a trochoid or pivotal or screw joint. It's also uniaxial articulation. So if you look at these two classic examples is your neck. It only goes one way. It's supposed to rotate just, you know, through the transverse plane, ro rotates around one axis of rotation. That one axis in it, and the head will rotate around, rotate around that one axis. Another one is the um, distal radial ulnar joints. It only goes one way. It rotates one way internally and externally. 
The next one is the condyloid or knuckle joint. It's a biaxial ball and socket joint. It means two ways. Bi means two. It has two different types of surfaces. One surface is oval, concave, received by another bone with an oval convex surface. So if you look at this, let's look at the second, third, fourth, and fifth metacarpophalangeal or knuckle joints. All right, let's look at that. If you look at this, it does flexion, extension, abduction away from the mid away from the midline toward the midline which is adduction and it also does circumduction we also have the wrist articulation between the carpals and the radius joint too it does flexion extension abduction adduction and circumductions as well the inarthroidal joint it's a multi-axial, triaxial ball and socket. It's a bony, rounded head fitted into the concave, articulated surface. The hip joint and the, and the uh, shoulder joint are perfect examples of that. A bony, rounded head fitting into a concave, articulated surface. Hip and shoulders, if you look at that, we do flexion, extension, we do abduction adduction if we move the arm in it does diagonal abduction adduction it also does rotation and circumduction rotation as well too and circumduction all the way through that hip joint does the same exact thing the last one is a saddle joint or what they call cellar it's a unique triaxial joint Two reciprocating concave and convex surfaces. There's only one example in the, in the body. A carpal metacarpal joint at the thumb. Now let's look at that. It does flexion, extension, adduction toward the midline, abduction away from the midline. It does circumduction and slight rotation. Very little. Now the next, let's talk about the movement of joints. Some joints permit only flexion extension, as like we saw in the uh, uh, elbow joint. Others permit a wide range of movement depending largely upon the joint structure. A contrast to fle only flexion extension is a shoulder joint, which does flexion extension, internal external rotation, abduction, adduction, diagonal, uh, and circumduction. So you can see the differences between the two joints. Now we use what we use to measure that is called a goniometer. It's used to measure the amount of movement in a joint and to measure joint angles. So first of all we have to find the area through which a joint may normally be may be freely may normally be freely and painlessly moved. We have to look at each joint accordingly to see how it can move without any pain. We will do a measurable degree of movement potential in any joint or joints. No. We will also, joint range of motion will be, will be discussed in a future learning module. Where we're actually, we will actually go through a number of assessment at, e, at each joint to see what the functionality of each joint is. So mo all, most of the joints that we, we're going to look at we can be measured with a goniometer and it's, it's from anywhere from 0 to 360 degrees. Because if you look at some joints, they will rotate in a full circle, which is 360 degrees. The goniometer is placed even with the axis of rotation at each joint. As the joint is moved, the goniometer arms are held in place along or parallel to the long axis of the bones on either side of the joint. The joint angle is then read from the goniometer. Now the normal range of motion for a particular joint varies in most people.
There are standards for each joint. They say, okay, if you look at a lot of physical therapy books, they say that the joints move, you know, a particular joint will move through this range of motion, but it will depend on the person, you know, uh, there, for, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of variables involved which could inhibit or impede joint range of motion.